As last season wrapped up and COVID-19 became a part of our lives, there were a lot of unknowns coming into this season. We knew we wouldn't be able to go to Canada most likely because the border would be closed, which was a major bummer for yeah, us. Yeah, major salt. And we honestly didn't know what regulations would look like in other states. You know, we wanted to go to Washington and Oregon and California and some of these states on the coast. We wanted to go with what we knew we could do and that was the state of Idaho. So we made a big tour around the state this year. Being that we've lived here for the last four years, we've really grown to know the Eastern Idaho area. We kicked off our season in Teton Valley and riding around the local zones that we love to ride constantly day in and day out. From there, we went to Northern Idaho, up in Coeur d'Alene, all the way to the very top, right near the Canadian border and down to the very southern part of the state in Twin Falls, central Idaho and Fairfield. We really did the entire tour, drove the whole state, and man, is it diverse. That is one thing that we learned this year, traveling all over Idaho. We have some of the coolest mountains you can ride over here, and it just keeps getting more and more unique the more you travel around the state. This state is completely diverse yeah. as far as landscape, terrain, climate goes. So it's cool to be on that edge of semi-arid climate into what can almost be described as rainforests and some of this stuff. One of my favorite parts about what we do is traveling to new places and exploring new zones, but there's something to be said about riding a zone that you're completely familiar with that's close to home. You know, going out for the day with friends and knowing where all the jumps are, having a loop in the back of your mind that you can go on and maybe take some people out on that haven't been out in the mountains before. Riding around home is really fun. Not only do you know a lot of the areas that you can ride at around here, know every jump like Jack said, but there is so much area that has yet to be explored. Jack and I have been really researching zones on Google Earth and through our mapping systems on our phone to be able to find out new areas that we might just find something that no one has ever ridden on a snowmobile in before. Having dash-mounted GPSs on our sleds has been an asset this season. Being able to look down and see exactly where we're at and know where we need to go has been great for the exploration. Even though we mostly stuck around the state of Idaho this year, there's a ton of travel to be had, you know, crossing over between Idaho and Wyoming, riding to our local zones, and then going on some of these bigger sled trips. Fortunately, Dylan picked up a brand new GMC before this season, and we got hooked up with a Boondock Nation Edition Trails West trailer, along with a couple Duradex. So with those few things, we are able to take our sleds and all our equipment anywhere around this country, around this continent. We've almost put on 23,000 miles just on the truck. And that, like we said, is just driving around, touring Idaho and seeing what awesome riding it has to offer. We started off in Eastern Idaho here in uh, Teton Valley. It was absolutely beautiful. Rode that at the beginning of January. Saw some incredible Teton views per usual. That's something that we've become addicted to throughout the years. Today I'm gonna to be riding my Polaris 850 High Boost Boondocker Turbo. Um, it's a really fun sled. Cole is super experienced with uh, Avalanche Safety and he's gonna run us through a couple drills today and beacon checks. You guys uh, turn our radios on. We should all be to channel 212. Make sure that your beacon is actually recording uh, distance shortage. I'm gonna make sure that my beacon can find each and one of you as well. I want you to put your beacon on you where you're going to be riding with it for the day so that we know they're back in our pockets and secure.
bad, Cole. Oh, no. What happened? It's about as bad as it gets. Oh. Darn it. My arms. Yeah, the shock snapped. That's what happened with the The shock and both my arms. Yeah, that's pretty bad. Well, luckily, uh, you have a spare one at the house, right? Spare what? Shock. Yeah, I do. Yeah. This lower A-arm broke in both the front and the rear. So I've got a piece of a shovel here taped across the front to hopefully brace that. I've got a ton of paracord going here to hopefully hold this back end of the shock up along with the sway bar. I'm gonna crank my compression all the way up since I have no spring anymore. Oh man, looks like Jack's in a bit of trouble. Stay tuned to see if he makes it out. Hey, coming back at you with more from Boondock Nation. It's gonna get weird here. We're just gonna try and pull it completely off. Yeah. There she goes. This has gotta weigh like 20 pounds. It's gonna be some serious weight savings. It's definitely gonna be interesting. Not the first time I've ridden out on one ski before, but it's definitely the second. So we'll see how this goes. <laughs> What's he gonna do when he turns other way? He can only make right hand turns. One thing people ask me all the time when I tell them I live in Idaho in the winter is, are you near Coeur d'Alene? And I had never been to Coeur d'Alene before, especially on a sled trip up until this year. So we did that right away in January. It's been on our list for a long time. That was probably one of the most beautiful places we went this season. The forests there were so vast and the mountains were so unique with all of the lakes and just the city life was by far probably uh, the coolest sled experience I think we had all season. Southern Idaho was probably the biggest surprise. We were really anticipating this one because we had no idea what to expect. Coming into this the week before this shoot, there wasn't a lot of snow and the entire West was really hurting for snow in general. So we didn't know what to think, you know, being that it is Southern Idaho, it probably does get less snow on average than what we do up here, or at least takes a little bit longer to get it. But we checked the forecast and 48 hours before we were arriving, a 50 inch snowstorm dumped on southern Idaho. There was so much snow that we had no reason to go above around 6,000 feet. So the sleds were ripping, it was easy to breathe, the snow was a little bit heavier because he needed a little more traction when yeah. it was that deep. And we were able to go out there and that was the first chance that we had this season to ride some sweet pow.
During the break, subscribe to our YouTube channel to check out all of our videos. Welcome back to this awesome episode of Boondock Nation. Needless to say, we had absolutely epic conditions. Probably top two best snow we rode all year was in Southern Idaho. And man, I wanna go back. The mountains were probably some of the most unique we've ever ridden. And just the proximity to Twin Falls and the desert to be able to recreate year round there is unmatched. Our outerwear is extremely important. If we're in a survival situation, the last thing you wanna be is wet and cold. So we wear fly racing gear from head to toe, from our base layer to our outerwear, because we know that stuff will keep us dry when we're out in the mountains. I have been super impressed and super pumped to be a part of the fly racing family for the last two seasons. The gear has only gotten better. If you guys have not seen it yet, please be sure to go on to flyracing.com and check it out. The stuff is legit, the colors are sick, and it performs great. Not only is the outerwear outstanding, but the helmets are the best in the industry. They're the safest snowmobiling helmet you can buy right now. Rion technology, 14K carbon fiber weave in their formula series. We use these helmets all year round too, for dirt biking, UTVing in the summer, even out on the jet ski if we're getting a little progressive. <laughs> um, but they are by far the best snowmobile helmet you can buy these days. Aside from that, you need survival equipment if you're heading into the mountains. One of the last things we ever want to do is spend the night, but it could happen, and it could happen very easily. So we always come prepared with fire starters, uh, the ability to build a shelter, multiple saws, string, paracord. Yeah. The list is pretty endless. And let me tell you, the more time you spend in the mountains, the more you start to pack with you. My bag gets heavier and heavier every day throughout the course of the season. A couple years ago, a good friend of ours, Lars, was dealt a pretty poor hand. He cased a jump, broke his femur. Oh, no, no, no. It was just kind of in and out, and I remember waking up during the flight a couple times, and, oh, are we there yet? And I'd lift my head up, and I'd look, and I'd just see trees and mountains. I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> Luckily, we were prepared for the situation. We are able to get him hellied out of there, but there were things that we could have done better, and because of that, I feel like that has kind of changed the way that we look at going riding for a day. We bring med kits, like Jack said, fire starter, and just endless survival supplies. You guys, you cannot be too prepared to go out for a day of snowmobiling. You never know what hand you're gonna get dealt. Like what you're watching? Then be sure to stick around for more Boondock Nation. Welcome back to this episode of Boondock Nation. Avalanche danger is always present when you're traveling in the backcountry in the winter time. So we take every precaution we can carrying a transceiver, probe, and shovel in case there's a companion rescue situation. We try and prevent an avalanche at all costs by minimizing our risk as we travel through terrain, but you never know when something's gonna happen. So for that reason, we also wear Highmark avalanche packs. These are airbags that are contained within our backpacks that have a trigger right here. So if we feel the mountain starting to slide around us, we can pull that trigger, it inflates this giant airbag out of our backpack, making us less dense hopefully floating to the surface. It also protects you from trauma, which is the second leading killer in avalanches. This is a pretty bad insurance policy, you guys. You never wanna to have to rely or use this equipment, like period. Manage your risk accordingly. Every time you go out there, talk with your group, make sure you're making decisions as a group and you're all comfortable with how you're traveling through the terrain. The biggest 
recommendation that I think we can both offer is just go to some sort of avalanche training. You think that just going to a class that is a general avalanche course is gonna help prevent you getting into an avalanche or companion rescue scenario. And I can tell you after doing our AST1 course, I feel like we still have so much to learn and obviously there is still so much to learn. So it is definitely our mission to continue with our avalanche education and continue to progress in our avalanche education, get our ASC2, level three, whatever it might be, and uh, just never be careful enough. We've been trying to take avalanche classes every year since we started snowmobiling, whether it's a class back in the Midwest, one of the Skidoo Mike Duffy classes, yeah. or an AST1 from Avalanche Canada or an Airy Level 1. Even if you have a certification, it doesn't hurt to take more classes. Maybe it's not a certification class, but just to brush up on your skills at the beginning of the season. That Avalanche education can never hurt, and it's given us a lot more confidence as we travel through the backcountry to be able to minimize our risk and ride another day. So if you guys want more information on our avalanche course that we took last season, be sure to check out the link on our YouTube channel to License to Ride, where we took our AST1 course up in Valemount, British Columbia with Frozen Pirate. It isn't just about the destination when you're going on a sled trip. It's all about the experiences you have while on the road. You never know what you're gonna run across at a truck stop or at a hotel or whatever it might be along the way bad weather, road conditions. It's just an adventure from the second that you put your truck and drive and pull out of your house to go to a new place you've never ridden a sled before. Yeah, isn't that the truth? We've done so many trips from Wisconsin to Idaho and back, everywhere in between. And I don't know if we've seen it all, but we've just about seen it all. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I will say is it's definitely a lot when you're looking at the phone and the GPS tells you you got a 20 hour drive to your next destination. But if you can get over that and just enjoy the ride, it is well worth it. The experiences you'll have traveling around in the winter and going snowmobiling are unmatched. I do know what's next and that's, uh, I'm gonna get in the truck and drive 21 hours home. We're gonna live it up this summer in Wisconsin and just enjoy the lake life. Jack and I are gonna do a little bit more lifestyle, show you guys what it's like to live in two different parts of the United States. And you guys can follow along the journey of what we do in the summer, and obviously you already know what we do in the winter. So we just wanna let you guys a little bit more in on what we do day to day. We're just gonna keep doing our thing and we're gonna keep being us. And we're rolling. From tuning? Yeah. All right. Tuning the sled does a lot for rideability. It adds, um, Probably, I don't, I don't know what to say. Here, one of those same things for you. Actually, I do know. <coughs> I like that. We should probably just readjust, huh? Isn't it 21,000 miles to drive around the world? Isn't that what they say? Yeah. The circumference of the world? I think so. Are you getting service back here? Yeah. Oh, I have, I have one bar of LTE right here. Beautiful. Nice watch. Thanks.